Well, we're excited to have Dr. Tim Lane with us tonight. Uh, he is uh, a friend of this church, and for some of you, many of you have read some of his books. Um, he is located outside Atlanta in uh, Peachtree City. He is the founder and president of the Institute for Pastoral Care. It's a nonprofit that equips local churches to care for their people. And he's also uh, the founder of Tim Lane and Associates, which is a counseling uh, practice located in Peachtree City. He's a minister in the Presbyterian Church in America, having been ordained in 1991, and he is a member of the Metro Atlanta Presbytery. And he, you might also want to know that he was the pastor for uh, 10 years of Clemson Pres and Clemson back in the 90s. So uh, he has not been that far away from us, but he's a Georgia grad, loves the Bulldogs, and uh, we don't hold that against him. We invited him anyway. Um, Tim has authored a number of books. I'm not going to go into all of those. The one that we're most concerned about tonight is Unstuck. It's a nine-step process to how people change. And we just felt like this would be a great time for us to sort of drop the plow and learn what does it look like when, when you're shepherding other people and walking through processes with them. What does that what does it look like and how do you understand what they're going through and the different steps that are involved in that? So over actually the next year and a half, we're going to be working our way through in these intensive training sessions, uh, his book. So uh, I hope you have it. If you don't have it, it's easy to find on Amazon or if that's a, a problem for you, come find me and we'll get you a copy of the book. You also have a copy of his slides that are on the table and you can take notes on those uh, uh, sheets of paper. Uh, we spent almost two hours this afternoon uh, in an interview context, and so in June at our special training time and in October in our special training time, we're also going to have Tim here via that interview process. So, Tim, let me pray for you, and then we'll ask you to come and share with us. Father, <clears throat> thank you for calling us, first of all, to be your children, your sons and daughters. We're honored by that privilege that you give us. More than that, tonight you have called each of us into this uh, particular work of serving your church, a church for whom your son died. And so uh, it is important work. And I thank you for these women shepherds. I thank you for the elder shepherds. I thank you for our deacons and others who are here tonight who love your people and want to serve them. So open our hearts and our minds tonight to hear all that you want to teach us through this servant of yours. We ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, Mike. And thank you for the invitation tonight. I'm uh, preaching to the choir. This is what I love to see. Um, as, a, as a former pastor and then... Uh, 10 years and 15 years te uh, teaching in a seminary context we were, where we were training pastors to do a better job of not just exegeting a passage, but actually shepherding and, and caring for people. Uh, ironically, you don't get a whole lot of training in that space in uh, most seminaries. And so um, it's heartening to see what, what the pastors here have done and, and what you all are doing as a church. So I'm, I'm grateful to be here, and I, I look forward to to highlighting some things from the book that I think hopefully will be helpful for you in, in terms of equipping you, um, not only as you think about helping other people, but first and foremost, as you think about how do I grow in grace? How do I personally experience the grace of the gospel in my daily life? Because that really is going to be the main catalyst that not only enables you, but motivates you to want to be a part of helping someone else experience God's grace in, in tangible ways. Um, so uh, just uh, by way of introduction, um, uh, one of the things I want to emphasize tonight is just kind of what, I'm, what I am doing and what I'm not doing. Uh, what I am doing is I'm going to give you an overview of the book, The Nine Steps. I don't want to um, reiterate too much what's already written in the book, but Try to, try to help you understand how this works itself out in, uh, in a, a shepherding, pastoral care, uh, discipling relationship. And I want you to understand that 
you know, if you've lived long enough, you know that growth and grace is never linear and never straightforward and never easy. It's always complex. It's back and forth. It's up and down. It's all over the place. So don't be deceived when you look at this book and say, here are the nine logical linear steps that if you do them, you will become like Jesus in a week. All right. It won't happen. Maybe some of you have already tried that and, it, and it's failed. So I'm just uh, letting you know that it's okay. Um, this, these are the way I think about this book. I, I was thinking about what am I trying to work into the life of someone that I'm caring for, whether it's in a formal counseling context where I spend a lot of hours, uh, every week, whether it's a conversation between me and my wife, whether it's an interaction that I'm having with one of my four grown children or my two grandsons, um, whether it's a church member that pulls me aside in the hallway uh, in between uh, services, what, what, am I, what am I trying to inculcate in that relationship as much as I can given the amount of time I have, All right, also being realistic? And so what, what uh, I've highlighted in the book are what I would call key elements or aspects that you need to be thinking about when you think about growth and grace in your own life but also what you want to be mindful of when you think about helping someone else grow in grace. Uh, you're not going to be able to do all these things in two minutes, right? This may happen over many uh, weeks, many months, years even, in terms of your involvement in an individual's life, a family's life, a couple's life. Uh, but these are, these are aspects or elements of uh, the growth and grace process, all right? So it's not, uh, it's not a linear kind of methodology. I can come back and talk about more methodology at some other time, but uh, um, this is not primarily what the book is about. I think you can uh, draw from it, you know, when you think about these elements, what you want to be doing regularly as you're helping people. Uh, but here's, here's the overall picture. And the way, that I, the way that I break down these, uh, these, these chapters are in four uh, different ways. First of all, gospel awareness, self-awareness, gospel awareness, other awareness. All right? Uh, so in chapters one and two, I start with gospel awareness. I'm going to unpack that in just a moment. In chapters 3 through 6, it's self-awareness. What do I need to be seeing about myself so that I can understand how to apply the gospel to my life, which is gospel awareness 2, which is in chapters 7 and 8, and then other awareness is in chapter 9. So chapters 1 and 2, gospel awareness, chapters 3 through 6, self-awareness, Chapters 7 and 8, Gospel Awareness. Chapter 9, Other Awareness. And then if you haven't finished reading the book yet, the last chapter is a case study, and it's a gentleman by the name of Jim who struggles with anxiety, and I just walk through each of the steps to kind of illustrate what that might look like as uh, Jim seeks to grow in grace in this area of his life. Okay? In, uh, in this particular chapter, we're starting with gospel awareness. So, um, so often what I find in my own life and as I'm working with other people is uh, they start with their problem, either it's a temptation and a struggle with sin, or there's an experience of suffering that they've been through, and that really becomes their identity. So if you've been through, let's say, the horrible experience of divorce, you can find yourself a, kind of uh, uh, rooting your identity, who you are in that experience. I am a divorced person, or I am someone who has experienced this type of trauma. Um, I've been through this experience, or I struggle with this sin, therefore I am a... And that becomes uh, the person's identity, and, and that's oftentimes where we get stuck. 
That's one of the places where we get stuck. We root our identity in our experience of suffering or a struggle with a particular temptation or sin. And so this chapter is intended to kind of begin to, to really break up that, that hard soil of, of where you've gotten stuck and say, wait a minute, there, there is a different fundamental identity uh, that you have as a person. And, and I'm assuming, obviously, at this point, that this person is a professing believer. All right, I'm, I'm thinking about them in, in, that, uh, in that way. Um, and uh, uh, what happens just physiologically, so if I'm constantly thinking of myself as someone who suffered this experience or I'm struggling with this particular temptation or sin, guess what happens in your brain? you begin to develop neural pathways and you automatically go to that identity. And, and, and what we want to do is we want to create a new way of, of thinking um, about uh, ourselves and uh, that, that also translates into helping someone else start to rethink their identity. Um, a few weeks ago... Um, a husband came to me, and, and I, I deal with marriages where there have been different types of infidelity. Um, actually, this was many months ago. Uh, a husband came to me, and he confessed, disclosed that he had been unfaithful to his wife. And um, we started talking a little bit about some of the details, and I said, you know what? We're going we're gonna to go through a process, you and me and your wife, as we, as we address your infidelity, but I want to I want to frame what we're doing in a in a bigger context. So here here is me thinking about, and this person is a professing believer. I have no reason to doubt that they're not a Christian. Um, and so what I did, as I said, I, I want to frame what we're going to be doing with this passage. And I don't always read a passage of scripture. Sometimes I'll just summarize. Um, and another occasion, I had a, a a husband come to me, and he had just uh, confessed to me that he had been unfaithful to his wife, and he and he said, "This was when I was a pastor in Clemson." And he said, "I don't, I don't have a clue why I'm here talking to you, my pastor." And I had to say, "You came to the perfect ideal place because that's why we're here as a church, and this is why Jesus came." I was reframing his identity. His identity was rooted in, "I'm a betrayer." I, I've been unfaithful to my wife. He was moving in that direction. That's my identity. No, Jesus has come to, to give you a very different, more fundamental uh, identity than that. But in, in this other situation, I read this passage uh, to this husband, and uh, he would come back each week, and this passage would be on his mind. I said, I want to frame what we're doing, and uh, I want to read... Uh, Hebrews 4, and I read this passage to him. I said, you may be familiar with, with this passage. And I said, let me, let me just read this first part. It's a, it's a bit scary and ominous, but let me read it anyway. It says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. You know, obviously he's sitting there thinking, I said, look, God knows everything. He's, he's seen it all. So when we're going through the, this disclosure process, you're going you're gonna to be open and honest with your spouse about what God already knows. But I said, but he, here's something else I want you to hear. And this is where the shift started happening. The passage doesn't end there. It, it goes on in verses 14, 15, and 16, and it says this, Therefore, in light of the fact that we, we live before the face of God, he sees it all. There's nothing hidden from him. Then it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence 
so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And this husband is sitting there thinking, all right, God knows everything, but at the very same time, he's inviting me to approach the throne of grace. And it says with confidence so that I can cry out to God, Lord, help me, give me grace and mercy in my time of need so that this repentance that needs to happen in me and this process of reconciliation that I so want with my, my wife can actually begin and happen. And so I was just in that moment reframing his identity and saying, yes, we have an experience. We have a temptation and decisions you've made. And yes, you've sinned against your spouse, but this is where, this is where we're going to begin. This is, where, this is how we're going to frame what we're doing. Uh, I love the way Romans does it in Romans 8. Romans 8 says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. Then Romans 8, 12, there's another therefore. Therefore, let us live according to the spirit, not according to the flesh. And so what we're doing is we're creating a safe place for people to come out of hiding. And the only way you can do that is to say there's a safe place in the universe, and that's with our, our gracious and redeeming God. And so, so just finding ways to... Um, to allay people's fears, to give them hope, to let them know that, it's a, that, that there's a place where they can bring all of their junk and mess and, and, and they, will be, they will be greeted with, with grace, transforming grace, but also accepting grace, okay? So when you think about ministry, you want to think about how you can reframe their story. And uh, obviously that requires a lot of wisdom um, and it may not be that you open up Hebrews 4 and read it. it may not be appropriate, but how can you encourage someone uh, to, to think in, in that framework? The, the second step is also a very important part of uh, gospel awareness. There we are. And this is what we need to do with ourselves, but we also need to help other people do this. So, so often what can happen is when we get zeroed in on a negative experience, uh, an experience of suffering, or we're, we're only seeing our faults and our failures, uh, we start to only see the negative. And we fail to see uh, the Spirit's work in our lives. Um, I, uh, I worked with a a woman who had been a student at Clemson, graduated years later, contacted me, and she was um, going through a, a horrendous divorce. There had been um, domestic violence in the marriage. Uh, she wound up in a uh, do domestic uh, violence shelter, um, and uh, the divorce uh, dragged on and on and on. Uh, counseled her and worked with her peri periodically, uh, just recently spoke to her again about six months ago, and this has been 10, 15 years that we've been checking in with one another. And at some point, I remember saying to her, you know, you've been through a lot. You've suffered a lot. But one of the things, and by the way, she was also suicidal early on. Just, just to throw that in the mix, all right, to, to make it a little more complex. <clears throat> um, I said, you know, what, what I really marvel at is that I hear just a lot of resilience in your voice that has developed over the past several years. You, you don't sound like the same person. And I was able to say, you know, that, that's evidence, that's a mark of God's spirit at work in your life. And she said, you know, I really appreciate you saying that because I don't see that myself. I only see all the suffering I've, I've been through and the mistakes I've made. I said, no, you're a different person than you were two, three years ago. Uh, so what, what, what's the point I'm trying to make? One of the things that we need to do in our own lives, but also in the lives of others, is we need to be on the lookout for marks of the Spirit's work in a person's life. 
when someone is struggling and uh, all they see is the negative, are you able to say, well, wait a minute, do you realize that you're actually coming to me and you're asking for help? You're expressing your neediness. Do you know that that is a wonderful, wonderful mark of God's spirit at work in you? Can you, can you, can you see those things in other people and, and are you able to highlight them? Um, Paul does this. Paul gives us kind of a, a way of, of thinking about this. He's writing to the, the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians. And, and here's what's happening in the church at Corinth. You have an incestuous relationship, dirty church politics, intense rivalries. Uh, Christians are suing one another. There are deep divisions between the rich and the poor. People are misusing their spiritual gifts for self-aggrandizement rather than rooting them in the fruit of the Spirit and using them for the good of others. Just all kinds of crazy things. It, it kind of... It kind of makes me hopeful for, you know, most local churches when I read the, 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 the letter to the Corinthians. I'm like, oh, okay, we're normal, right? But, but that's what's happening in the church at Corinth. And here's how Paul starts his letter to the Corinthians. He says, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere, who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus, for in him you have been enriched in every way. That's how he starts the letter to the church at Corinth. What is Paul doing? Paul is is on a scavenger hunt and he's looking for every single ounce of the mark of the Spirit in this church's life, and he's highlighting those things. Have you ever uh, found yourself in a relationship, and, and maybe this is true when you're a parent parenting teenagers. Um, I, had a, I had a real struggle when I was parenting my four children as they went through the teen years. I was really prone to only see the negative and the bad decisions they made and highlight them and mark them and tell them. And I, it was almost like I had to do a 180. Wait a minute, Tim. I wonder if there's some really positive, good things going on in your child's life. And I wonder if you could find some of those and take a moment to verbalize how much you appreciate about what you see in your child. And I'm going to tell you, as a parent with four teenagers, been through the teenage years four times, there is nothing more needed in a teenager's life than encouragement from their parent. Nothing. All right, so what, what's the point? In this uh, second element of, of care for others, obviously applying it to your own life, we want to go on scavenger hunts, positive scavenger hunts, and we want to highlight anything and everything that is a mark of the Spirit. You're coming to me for help. Are, you're, you're still, you mean you're still reading your Bible after you lost your child? You're still, are you, you mean you're still coming to church? You're, you're still reaching out to that Christian friend and you're getting together? You're still grappling with your grief and you're, you're processing that grief before the Lord and you're, you're praying agonizing prayers, but you're praying and you're talking to God. All that is a mark of the Spirit. All that's good stuff. So that's, that's the work that we want to be about. All right, that's, that's gospel awareness. And so you're helping someone reframe their identity. You're grounding them in the gospel and you're also helping them see that, that while they may be really struggling, there, there is still evidence that the Spirit has begun a good work and he is going to continue that work to the day of completion. Right? We read about that in Philippians 1. All right, that, that's um, 
gospel awareness, steps one and two. Now let me talk a little bit about uh, personality and, and uh, emotions. This is moving into self-awareness. This is where, um, you know, you're, you're taking a look at yourself. Now, remember, if you skip gospel awareness one, if you, if you skip grounding in Christ and scavenger hunt, when you start to look inward personally, you're going to get more and more depressed because all you're going to highlight is failure. And you're not going to see your identity. That's also what's going to happen as you care for and minister to people. They need to be brought into a safe space so that you can begin to help them look at themselves. And, and one of the, the areas that I talk about in the book, I, I wanted this to be two separate chapters, but just looking at uh, personality and emotions. And I think about uh, this chapter in terms of looking at a person through the lens of creation. How, what is their hardwiring? How, how have they been uh, wonderfully uh, uh, woven together uh, by God in, in his providence, uh, the DNA that they, they uh, have had passed down to them from, from their, their parents and grandparents, good things and challenging things, uh, but, but just looking at, uh, at personality and, and emotions. Um, you know, when you think about personality, um, these, are, these are strengths that every person brings to the table. And, and we all have strengths. We all have unique aspects of our personality. I break this down more in the chapter, introverts, extroverts, task-oriented people, people-oriented people, uh, the, the, the ways that we go about getting things done, how we're productive, and we're all very different. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we want to focus on when we think about uh, working with someone is sometimes you, you may be an introvert and you may be an empath and you're meeting with someone who's an extrovert and a, a go-getter. And if you're not careful, you can misread that person, right? And, and, and misunderstand, wait a minute, this is, this is how they're wired. It's not, it's not sinful or immoral it it just is and and they're different and how do i how do i uh work with them in terms of their personality um and how will the fruit of the spirit begin to express itself through their personality so you're you're wanting to focus on getting to know them and and their their unique hardwiring and and i say this in the book on page 51 it says your personality uh, is a part of the unique way, wonderful way that you've been created by God. As such, much of our personality and even emotional makeup is present from birth, but they can also be shaped as we grow up. And our personality and emotional makeup are woven into us by God. It means that these patterns are inherently good. Our differences in this area are to be celebrated. So what's the point of all this? Change will look different for each person. It will occur along the contours of one's God-given personality and emotional makeup. Why is it important to state this? Because sometimes we are too quick to go on a sin hunt in another person's life when what we are dealing with are simple but important differences. So I'm, I'm more of an extrovert. I'm more of a direct person. That can be a great strength in a certain situation. But through growth and grace and growth and wisdom, I've realized that being an extrovert and being direct isn't always what's needed and what's wanted. Uh, when I uh, counsel people, if I don't dial my behaviors back and become more inquisitive, asking questions and listening... And I do what I'm doing tonight, right? If I, if I just launch into lecturing the person and teaching them, guess what? I'm going to lose them. And so a strength in one situation may be a weakness in another situation. And being aware of that, I'm able to dial what I'm doing around and say, okay, I'm going to be more quiet. I'm going to ask questions and I'm just going to let you talk. I'm going to draw you out because that's what is going to help you most. Um, if you're an introvert, 
Sometimes you need to step out of that introversion and be more engaging, right? And reading the situation is what's important. Uh, But the bottom line is personality is. Uh, This is where I think we, we have been given the language recently of emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is just wisdom. Uh, how, how do I show up? When can that be helpful? When do I need to read the room, if you will, and show up differently? Um, the other thing I think is important in this chapter uh, is just the, the role of emotion. So here's, here's what we often do when we talk about emotions. Rationality is superior. Emotions are inferior. All right? And uh, that's, a, that's a, a bifurcation that is, is a falsehood. When you read the Bible, reason and emotions are both equally valued and important. In fact, it's what makes you a human being. Uh, and there's, there's a joke now that goes around that, that science has actually proven that men do have emotions too. Okay? Brain science has proven it. Um, but, but we... We talk about emotions and we say rationality is superior to emotions. You actually need both. So think about rational thought and emotional thought in in the way that you would think about a ski boat. If you have a ski boat sitting in the water and uh, you have an engine and you have rudders, right? The engine would be emotion. So that's that's what emotions are. Emotions are energy. They're the impulse to act and to move into life. The rudders would be rational brain. So right brain is more emotional, left brain more rational, upstairs brain more rational, downstairs brain more emotional. In an ideal world, you want all those different regions of your brain talking to one another. That's actually emotional intelligence, where the different regions of your brain are talking to one another. If, if, if all you have is emotion... And, and that, that is the engine of the boat. What's that boat going to do? It's just going to, it's going to move, right? But it's not going to be steered or directed. It's going to be all over the lake and, and it's going to hit other boats. It's going to run up on the, the, the shore. It's going to damage itself. But if all you have is rudders and no engine, what does the boat do? Just sits there. It looks good in the water, but it goes nowhere. You need rudders and you need engine. And so it's important as we think about emotions uh, to to not shame people when they are emotional. Uh, We we talk about negative emotions and positive emotions. And sometimes we think negative emotions are bad, positive emotions are good. So positive emotions, joy, gratitude, excitement, love, love. Negative emotions, fear, anger, loneliness, confusion, all of those emotions can be good or bad. They can be managed well or managed poorly. Let me give you an example. Joy. We think about joy. Joy is a positive emotion. I have joy when I worship the Lord, when I think about the, the blessings in my life, when I think about my relationship with my wife. There's an emotion of, of joy or gratitude. Well, what if you hurt my feelings and someone else hurt your feelings and I experienced joy as a result of that? That's a positive emotion that's being managed in not a good way, right? So I'm, I'm happy, I'm joyful that you got your feelings hurt. So positive emotions can be managed poorly and can be managed well. Think about the emotion of fear. When you think about the emotion of fear, the the, the emotion of fear is the emotion of safety. Did you know that you did not arrive at this church tonight without the emotion of fear operating as you drove your car here? Fear was functioning in a positive way to make you alert to road signals, uh, stoplights, other drivers. Fear was functioning in a positive way. Can fear go negative? Yes. But it's not about 
pitting emotions against one another or pitting emotions and rationality. It's, it's about bringing those two together. And so when you're working with people, you want to realize that you're dealing with different personalities. You're dealing with different emotions. And uh, oftentimes, it's not necessarily sinful. It's just different. Um, you know, I, I work, again, with couples where there has been infidelity and the spouse that's been betrayed comes in and they're, they're shocked, they're confused, they feel stupid, they feel ashamed, and they're angry. And I say, you know what? If I didn't see anger in you, I would worry about your relationship with your husband or your wife. Your anger is saying that the relationship matters. It's saying that you don't like what happened. That's a good thing. So being able to, to work with people in that space is important. So that's, that's an area of self-awareness. Um, I'm not keeping up with these slides. Um, wow. Oh, I'm going backwards. Yeah. What's, what's another aspect of self-awareness? So chapter 4 in the book, or step four, is critical. This is understanding your circumstances. And there are four icons. This probably could have been four separate chapters. And this is probably where, uh, as, you're, as you're grounding people in the gospel, you're encouraging them, you're looking for evidence of the Spirit. This is where you're drawing them out and you're getting to know them. There are, there are four aspects of a person's context. And what is a person's context or situation? Anything outside of the person's soul, starting with their body and brain, and their life experiences, their current circumstances, and their present triggers, that is your situation. Okay? Uh, and those icons, so the, the top left is brain and body. Um, I'm, I'm working with, uh, again, I, I think about this in terms of dyads. So I'm thinking couples. I've got a, a spouse who's an engineer, and I've got another one who's a social worker. Those are two different brains, right? Two, diff two very different brains in the way they process life. Um, uh, how about your body? What if, you have, what if you're working with someone and they have a chronic illness? or they're dealing with chronic pain. That's a bodily reality that you want to pay attention to. Um, so you're, you're, you're paying attention to brain and body. Um, baggage, that second icon on the right, that's a person's history. Um, what, what has their life been like? And then the boot, the top, the bottom left, that's the person's terrain. What are, what are the major issues that they're dealing with in their life? What stage of life are they in? Uh, are they a parent? Uh, what, what's their work situation like? What are, what are other pressure points and, and what are other positive things that are going on in their lives in, in, in the, the, more, uh, the, the bigger things in their life? And then the weather. The weather is what are the triggers? The things that happen in any given day, a micro moment that can trigger someone that, that connects to their, their, their history and their story that causes them to react in a certain way. What you're doing when you're, you're understanding yourself or understanding another person in this category is you're appreciating their story. Let me, let me tell you why this matters. I'll, I'll have someone come up to me and, and they'll, they'll say, I'm struggling with X, Y, or Z. And initially, it sounds pretty serious, I'm like, wow, you know, de debilitating anxiety, debilitating depression. Um, I'm struggling with this particular temptation. And I'll say, well, tell me a little bit about yourself. Tell me, tell me your story. Tell me, where, where are you from? Uh, any, any significant events happen uh, as you were growing up? What was your relationship like with your mom and dad? Um, oh, you moved 16 times growing up. Hmm, that's, that's interesting. And uh, you're struggling with anxiety. I, I, you know, I wonder if there's any connection here. What, what, what were those moves like? Well, I was always the new kid on the block, and I was always picked on. 
And I was always made fun of. Oh, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense as I get to know you and, and your story and, and these life-shaping experiences, boy, it makes a lot of sense why you're struggling with anxiety. In fact, if I had been through what you've been through, I'd probably struggle with anxiety too. In fact, there's some similar things in my story that are connected to what you're sharing with me. And, and here's where I struggle, right? So what, what's happening in this particular uh, section is you're really getting to know uh, a person and, uh, and, and their hardwiring, but also their history. And, and here's what you're doing. This is what's key. You're understanding and appreciating how complex every single human being is. Brain, body, life experience, major life circumstances right now, triggers. Every individual is uniquely complex. And, and we, don't, we don't want to just treat everybody the same, right? If you, if you meet with some people and they struggle with anger, well, here, here, here might be the complex reasons why this per person struggles with anger. You meet another person, you think, oh, anger, I've seen that before. Let me just apply what I've learned here to this. And you're dealing with a completely different person. So you have to take the time to, uh, to unearth and understand uh, a person. And this is the, the wonderful opportunity you have. So I, I'm in a formal counseling context. People come in maybe once a week, once every other week for an hour, maybe an hour and a half. What is, what is so wonderful in a situation like this in the body of Christ is you're spending a lot more time than that with people. And you have a lot more opportunities to just say, tell me more. Tell me more. I really want to understand uh, more about your story. Uh, I'm, I'm curious. I'm inquisitive about, about who you are and, and what you struggle with and why. Because I want to be, uh, I want to be helpful. And, and here's, here's what we can do oftentimes is when someone approaches us and they're approaching us with a problem... Our, our instinct is to, one, want to fix the problem or change their emotions. How many of you ever done that if you're married with your spouse? So my wife's driving home. She's upset. And uh, she's talking about this employee. And I say, you know, you should just get HR involved. Uh, in fact, they report to you. I don't, I don't know why you just don't address this one-on-one -on -one with them. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're really angry and, uh, you, you really don't need to be angry. You have a lot more control than, than, than you realize. So I never even get that much information out. And for some strange reason, the cell phone signal drops. <laughs> right, I have missed an opportunity because I want to problem solve or I want to change my spouse's emotions. Oftentimes that's coming from a, a, a well-intentioned place. I don't like to see my wife dealing with problems. I don't like to see her experiencing negative emotions. But what if I do this? Oh, you, you really sound frustrated. I, I can't believe that you're having to deal with that again. That's got to be really, really difficult. Boy, that, that cell signal is the strongest it's ever been. And she's like, I've got an ally. I've got someone who who's listening, who understands. They're not just trying to fix the problem or change my emotions. They're entering in. That's called incarnational ministry. What did Jesus do? He incarnated before he ever began to speak and proclaim. The very act of the incarnation is an act of great empathy. And I'm telling you, in the context of the local church, I'm, I'm actually letting you off the hook. You don't have to fix people. You don't have to change them. If, if all you'll do is invite them into a safe space and let them talk, and if you will listen to them, that incarnational experience of grace that they experience from you is, is almost like Jesus being present in that moment with them. You incarnate the love of Christ to to people by being curious and inquisitive and wanting to understand and get to know them. Okay, 
how are we doing time-wise? There, there's a lot more I could say. I'm just trying to highlight some things so we can do some Q&A. Um, here's, a, here's a, another aspect of self-awareness. So as you get to know a person's story, it should increase your patience and compassion for them. So when you do see them responding in ways that are unwise, maybe, maybe even sinful, and they're actually troubling their trouble by the way they're responding to their trouble, um, you, can, you can begin to help them see that and, and help them understand, well, how are you responding to life? Um, what, 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 is, what is your behavior communicating? And I, I use the image here of a gauge. Gauge your reactions. The, the image that I'm using here is the image of a car, okay? Um, in the Bible, a, a lot of times the, the analogy or the, the uh, metaphors that are being used to describe spiritual truths are agricultural. So a lot of times the Bible will use trees and there's fruits, there, there, there's fruit and root. Uh, I'm just updating the analogy and I'm talking about an engine and a, a, a dash uh, on your car. So if you're driving down the highway and your temperature gauge is in normal range, what does that tell you? It tells you okay, everything's good. Don't need to worry. Uh, engine's operating properly. Here's the response. That's, that's, a, that's a good response. We're good with that. What if the temperature gauge begins to move over into what is it? What is it when a car begins to overheat? Two hundred, two twenty. Is that is that where it is? Yeah, you you car engineers here. Um, but what is that gauge telling you? The gauge is telling you that there's something wrong, and that's the same thing with our behavior. So if you see someone responding to to difficulty and they're responding well good but if you see them responding in ways that aren't helpful might even be sinful uh, they may be uh, you know slipping into anxiety depression maybe even addiction right to self-medicate okay there isn't there is a problem there's a problem and and we we want to be able to see that the the challenge we have at this particular stage is when we start to look at our behavior and start to look inward uh, there are two equal and opposite errors, and, and you want to keep this in mind as you're working with people. So some people are unreflective activists. I don't have time to pay attention to my behavior and ask questions about what's going on. You know, this, this world is going to hell in a handbasket, and we've got to get out, of there and save get out there and save people for Christ. So let's just go. Get things done. All right? That's one error. You don't want to be an unreflective activist. You don't want to be another person to be an unreflective activist because if they are, they're probably going to start doing damage to their relationships. They're probably going to start hurting other people and doing unwise things. But you also don't want the equal and opposite error of morbid introspection where all you do is start to turn inward and, and say, oh, look at these terrible things I'm doing. You look inward and you begin to move into, you know, depression, sadness, shutdown. Uh, you, you don't want morbid introspection. And so the reason that we're, we're addressing this level of self-awareness at this point is prior to this, we've, we've grounded this ability to look inward in the gospel. Here's your identity in Christ. Here's the spirit at work in you. But there's still work that needs to happen, and that's okay. It's not the end of the world. So we can take a look at our behavior, and we can ask uh, questions about uh, why are we res responding the way that we're responding. And I, I unpack this more in the book by looking at uh, Galatians 5, uh, 19 through 21, the deeds of the sinful nature and the deeds of the new nature, uh, good fruit and bad fruit. And, and here, are, here are examples of good fruit and bad fruit. Bad fruit, obviously, the, uh, the sins of 
the sinful nature, the deeds of the sinful nature, here evidences of good fruit. You're responding to the pressures and temptations of life in ways that are helpful and good and godly. So you're able to ask yourself you know, basic questions and identify, how am I responding? Is this good? Is this profitable? Is it helpful? Or is it uh, counterproductive, destructive? Is it sinful? Is it ungodly? Um, and, and then that leads to this next step. All right, I, I see the, the behaviors, and okay, I see there's a mixture. I, I see good fruit in my life, but I also see bad fruit. I see things that I'm doing that need to change. So this is where we start to ask the question of looking underneath. Now, if you're driving your car down the highway tonight, I've got to drive back to Atlanta tonight, and I notice that my temperature gauge is moving over to uh, the place where my engine may overheat. I pull into a gas station, the mechanic comes out, and he says, oh, that's no problem, I can fix that in probably about 15 seconds. He comes with a hammer and some tape, he cracks the glass or plastic on my dashboard and then moves the needle, the temperature needle over and tapes it there. And he says, you're good to go. Have a safe trip back to Atlanta. What would you think? Yeah, I've, you, 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 you had him before. I mean, you're like, did this guy even go to mechanic school, right? Who, who is he, right? Because you have the, the good sense to know, unlike that mechanic, that that gauge is, is telling you what. The gauge is not ultimately the problem. The gauge is telling you that what? There's a problem in the engine. It's under the hood. And that's what our behavior is. Our, our behavior is a gauge. And it's telling us what's going on in the heart. What's going on in the soul? Um, what am I living for? What am I cherishing? What am I adoring? And how is that driving my behavior? And, you know, interesting, when you're dealing with a car, uh, it could be overheating. And usually it's probably three or four or five reasons. All right, I, I'm not... A mechanic, but I know this much about car engines. It could be a hole in a radiator hose. It could be a hole in the radiator. It could be that the water pump is wearing out and not pumping the water around. It could be a blockage in the radiator. It could be that I haven't changed my oil in months like I did in college and my car blew up. Right? And, and the oil just got thicker and thicker and, and the car overheated. There could be a lot of reasons why a, a car is overheating and it takes a good di a diagnosis to be able to say, okay, this is the problem, therefore this is what we need to do to fix the problem. If it's a bad water pump and you re replace the radiator, you haven't helped the person, right? Now, here, here's the, the important point. Car engines are very, very simple compared to the human heart. And, and this is where we need to be careful, not only in our own lives, but with others. When we start to move in the direction of trying to help someone see what's going on below the surface, what's going on in the engine, if you will, of your heart that's driving this behavior, we have to be very, very, very careful because people are much, much more complex than a car engine. And this is where we have to be gracious and patient and take our time with people. Give you an example. Um, I had a, a friend who was deathly afraid of flying. And... Uh, Everybody said, well, the reason you're afraid of flying is obvious, right? It's because you're afraid to die. Well, as you got to know this person, now, I know all of us at some level, level are afraid of dying. I don't even care if you say you're not, you are. Um, but, you know, if, w once you got to know him, you realized that his fear of flying really wasn't connected to dying. 
He said, no, I, I, I'm ready to die. I don't want to die. I'm not looking forward to it. Um, but, but that's really not my fear. And, and as, you get, as you would get to know this friend of mine, you would realize that what he was afraid of on that plane was not whether it crashed and he died, but it would be how he acted while the plane was crashing and what everybody else on the plane would think of him. I'm going to look like an idiot. That's going to be embarrassing. That's shameful, right? That was what was driving his anxiety. It was what other people would think of him. Well, what did that do? That opened up a window for him to say, well, gosh, I do that in my relationship with my wife. I, I do that at work. I, I'm living for other people's opinions. It's not that I'm afraid to die. It's I'm afraid of what you think of me. And, and you could miss an opportunity to help him if all you did is went for the simple, easy solution. Oh, it's the water pump. No, it's not the water pump. It's something else. So just a word of caution as we do help people think about what's going on below the surface. We want to be very, very patient and thoughtful as we help them do that. Let's see. Make, oh, yeah, here we are. Okay, so that's, that's self-awareness. Self-awareness is personality and emotions. It's um, your circumstances. It's looking at uh, how you're responding to your circumstances, and it's asking questions about what's going on below the surface. The way that you start to get at what's going below the surface is you ask the, the, the why and what questions. Why did I respond in that way? Um, and and here, here are a couple of what questions. What, what am I getting that I don't want? Or what am I not getting that I want? I want appreciation from my child. And I'm not getting it. So I become a harsh parent. I'm living for, I'm needing, I'm adoring, I'm worshiping and living for and revolving my life around getting appreciation from my child. Well, you know what, if, if, that's, if that's what you're living for and you have four children, there are going to be multiple wake-up calls throughout any given day that that ain't working, right? But you're asking that what am I getting that I don't want or what am I getting, uh, what am I getting that I don't want and what am I not getting that I want? Now, you have to do all of that work in order now to move to gospel awareness 2.0. And that's called make the connection. Uh, the icon here is one of location. Once again, now I'm back locating my identity in Christ. How does the gospel now meet me in that place of struggle? And this is where... Uh, uh, the Bible just comes alive. It says we, we are uniquely united to Jesus. And, and you know, in real estate, it's, it's all about location, location, location. When it comes to the Christian life, it's all about location, location, location. Where are you locating your identity? If you're, if you're locating your identity in how your spouse treats you, you're going to be disappointed. If you're locating your identity and success at work, that may work for a little while, but it may not work forever, right? All these things that we look to in creation, if we're looking to financial stability, boy, that's a, that's a rough one. You look at the stock market from day to day uh, if, you're, if you're living for financial security. And so um, understanding what you're living for and where you're locating your identity outside of Christ helps you understand, well, how do I need to locate my identity back in the gospel? What does that look like? And then on the basis of that, how do I now cry out to God for grace and mercy in my time of need? How do I relate to God in this moment so that my relationship with Christ is not just something theoretical, but it's functional in the moment? 
And what this is, is it's, it's going vertical. That's the arrow going up. Which then leads to moving out into other awareness. Where I'm being used by God to love and care for other people. Let me just finish with an illustration. We'll, we'll open it up for, um, for Q&A. All right, let me try to put some of this together. Um, what does this look like and feel like in real life? Let me give you kind of a, a real-life illustration out of my own life as a parent. Um, many years ago, when I lived in Philadelphia, I was sitting at home in my house, and uh, guess what? No one, was, no one else was there. It was glorious. There's nothing quite like being in your own home and nobody being there. It's like peace, comfort, no conflict, no issues, right? It's like being on an island all by yourself. It's, it's, it, it's, you know, it's the kingdom come down to earth. My kingdom come down to earth. Uh, I'm sitting there in my house, and um, my 13-year-old daughter walks in the front door, and she slams the, the front door. All of a sudden, I can feel my kingdom just kind of crumbling down around me. Right? All it took was a 13-year-old walking in the front door, slam the door. Then she stomps to the first flight of stairs, stomps up the first flight of stairs, stomps down the hallway, stomps up the, the second flight of stairs, turns the hallway into a room. And what does she do with her bedroom door? Slams it. Okay? Now... Thankfully, because I'm someone who's been growing in grace, I'm like, oh, gosh, something's not right here with me. I'm, I'm starting to get irritated. I'm a little frustrated. Uh, I'm feeling underappreciated. And so the gauges are telling me, oh, Tim, the, the engine's overheating, right? And I've seen this before. That's self-awareness. That's because I've, I've seen this pattern in me uh, Time and time again. Not only that, I, I, I said, hi, Hannah, when she was coming in the door. And she just ignored me and even said, I don't want to talk with you. Like, uh-oh. Um, I'm someone probably like you that can live for the need for appreciation, the need for respect, the need for control, the need for comfort, the absence of conflict, all of those things. And that's what was happening to me in the moment. Um, so I get up and being the, the godly Christian hu uh, husband and father that I am, I start stomping towards the first flight of stairs and I start, start stomping up the first flight. And I'm like, where did, where did this 13-year-old learn how to stomp upstairs as efficiently as I am? Right. I'm like, so so my my sinful responses are actually playing out in my body. The way that I step upstairs, I'm stomping. Right. What am I saying as I as I stomp up each stair? What is that? The tread or the riser? What's the flat part? The tread is the flat part. OK, I knew that there were two parts at least, but I'm bang, you know. I'm saying, I don't like this, how dare you? So there's anger, there's frustration, the gauge, there's something wrong under the, under the, the hood, Tim. Um, I, I get up the first flight of stairs, I turn down the hallway, and it just so happens that I had been doing sermon preparation all day. Isn't that wonderful? You know, I, I'm like, I'm, I'm preparing to teach God's people, how to live out the Christian life. Um, and I, I happen to be studying 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. And there was this one place that I had kind of zeroed in on. And uh, the passage says this. It says, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, our holiness, and redemption. So I'm walking down the stairs. I'm upset. 
And thankfully, in that moment, I've seen this pattern. This is, a, this is evidence of the Holy Spirit, just being aware that this is a pattern, right? That's a mark of the Spirit. And I just say, God, help me. I go vertical. God, help me. Here, here I go again. And this passage begins to, to connect. So I'm seeing these false objects of worship, of appreciation, comfort, respect, uh, control, all of those things, the absence of conflict, and I'm realizing, oh, I'm living for things that I'm not supposed to live for. These are bad gods. And, and, and the passage is highlighting for me what the true and, and, and living God and the God that is worthy of my worship has done for me. So it says, Tim, Jesus is your righteousness. Right now, Because of what Jesus has done, you are not only cleansed of your sin, but you are counted righteous before the God of the universe. And you at any moment, at any time, have a full and free audience with him. Why is your daughter saying she doesn't want to talk to you driving your behavior right now? Why isn't this, this relationship that you have with me? I'm going vertical. I'm like, this is amazing, right? And then... Tim, not only that, but I am your holiness. I have given you my Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in you. And you don't have to do the same old thing. It is not a foregone and predetermined conclusion that you have to stomp up the second flight of stairs. You can change. You have a new power within you. Why are you so concerned that you feel like you've lost control of your Your house, when you have the very control of the Holy Spirit in you, and you can do differently. Not only that, Tim, I am your redemption. I have rescued from, I rescued rescued you from the slavery of living for things like human appreciation and respect and the need for comfort and control. All good things in and of themselves, not inherently sinful, but when you make them your ultimate object of worship, they become really, really bad gods and they turn you into a really not nice person. You don't have to live in that, that space of slavery anymore. And that's a, a, a bit of a wooden kind of breakdown of what was going on. But what was happening is I was, I was seeing my, my relationship with Christ, my union with Christ. I was, I was conversing with him. I was going vertical. And that was addressing all the things that were going wrong under the hood. So I start up the second flight of stairs. And guess what I do? I just step. I just put one foot on the, the step, one foot at a time, and I do it very lightly. So already the Holy Spirit is changing and transforming me in terms of my body language. All right? I go from stomping to just walking upstairs, and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. I'm, I'm going up at about the same pace and the same amount, and, I, and, and all I'm doing is just you know, gently pushing up on the, the step. I get to um, my daughter's door, and um, something miraculous happens. If you think not stomping up the second flight of stairs was miraculous. And by the way, this is like Holy Spirit revival in dad's life. While daughter's in her room, she does not see any of this. I get to her door. And rather than doing this, right, when you bang on a door when you're angry and you do it this way, why do you do it this way? Because God has given you a little bit of a cushion there. And because, once again, you're committed to your own self-preservation, you don't want to hurt yourself, you do this. And you slam on the door. How dare you ignore me? This is my house. I pay the mortgage. You don't. Just go on. Oh, and then I can weaponize the Bible. Children should obey their parents. Honor your father and mother. So I even use the Bible and I weaponize it against my daughter. That's that's what I can do. But here's what happens. Rather than that, the Holy Spirit and just the power of the gospel and my functional relating to Jesus in this moment, I go from this, watch this. 
to that. That right there is like Holy Spirit, Great Awakening, John Edwards revival. This, right? Charity and its fruits. How do you know if someone really has experienced revival? Changed behavior, fruit. That's fruit. I, rather than this, I do this and I just tap on the door. And I say in a calm voice, because my breathing has come down, my heart rate is coming back down, my connection with the Lord is calming my body. Right? Some would even say, if you could take a video of my brain, the limbic region of my brain is not lighting up as much. And I just tap on the door, I say, Hannah, you, you seem upset, would you like to talk? Guess what she says? No, I don't want to talk with you. Go away. I'm like, oh, now I can bang on the door, right? You know, I was godly. You didn't appreciate it. Now I have a right to be ungodly. No, just a, a new, new context. I've got to say, all right. I was able to walk down the stairs. And um, probably two hours later, we're fixing dinner. We're all downstairs uh, my wife, my four kids, two cats and a dog, um, and uh, just start uh, talking to my daughter and just asking her questions about her day. And I, I started to learn some things about her rather than me. That, that's, that's miraculous, right? It's not about me. And I found out, number one, she had had what, what you call a 13-year-old mean girl day. Some girls had gossiped about her. She was hurt. Not only that, she had these bumps on her face that start happening in these, these adolescent, these painful adolescent years that I don't think any of us ever want to go back to, right? And, and so a lot of identity questions, uh, just who, who will like me, who will accept me, what do I look like, just all kinds of, you know, adolescent angst and anxiety that was stirring in her. And what I found out as I was inquisitive is I found out that her coming in the door, slamming the door, stomping up two flights of stairs and slamming her door had absolutely 100% nothing to do with me. What was I doing? Because I was being hijacked by false objects of worship, my need for respect and appreciation and comfort and control. I had made it all about me. And as soon as I made it all about me, then it was going to go south. But God in his mercy rescued me from myself through this gospel transformation, this repenting and believing in the gospel, applying it in the moment. And it enabled my daughter to get rescued from me. I got rescued from me. She got rescued from me. Now, let me just say something as we end here, all right, and then we can open up for Q&A. That illustration is unpacking many of the steps that we've covered, uh, trying to put it in a, a very concrete context of a micro moment of life that happened decades ago. That is, that is the same dynamic that is playing out in our lives every single moment of every single day. What are we going to live for? What's going to drive us? What's going to motivate us? What are we going to attach ourselves to? Where do we find identity and meaning? That's what's going to drive us. And how do we functionally live out the gospel? And here's why this is important. So you think, Tim, you know, one incident where you stomp upstairs and you bang on your daughter's door, that's not that big of a deal. Well, okay. I still think it's a big deal, but you're right. You know, but what if uh, my daughter is growing up in a home and that happens several times a week? You know, when she's five, six, seven, it's not happening. But when she hits teen years and then for, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and that's happening several times a week, all those little micro moments add up. You know, when you, when you launch a rocket, if it's a, a, a millimeter off at the base, it's going to be hundreds of miles off out in space. So these little micro moments are adding up to big things. And if I'm not growing, it's, it's her growing up with an ornery, mean dad, drill sergeant dad, 
who, you know, she just doesn't really like and she's really looking forward to leaving and going to college. When can I get out of here? But if on the other hand, she's experiencing a dad who's growing in grace and changing, albeit imperfectly, and when I do fail, coming back and asking for forgiveness and owning my sin, that's a very different relationship. Two completely different relationships. So what are, we, what are we capturing? We're capturing also in all of this the importance of the micro moments. If we're not learning it, if we're not helping other people learn how to apply the gospel, how to relate to Jesus in the micro moments, we're not really helping them when it comes to stepping in when there are big things that are happening. We, we want to try to help people navigate life in the micro moments. And this is what moves us out into caring for and loving others. But we have to get rescued first from ourselves before others can get rescued from us.